whether we will do some post uh, while holding the lock and not holding lock. Somebody I think in section one asked that question. I think it's an important question, right? Uh, yeah, so some post uh, in, so why do we, so technically speaking, so when we do some post, we normally don't hold any lock, right? This is not a condition variable where I said, you know, when you do con signal, it's better to hold on uh, mutex, right? So it's better to hold a log while you do con signal. For POSIX threads, it's not strictly required, but you know, uh, it's still recommended for predictive scheduling. And uh, as I said, that in some implementation, this is required. Uh, so you, so the, in other words, please just do whenever you do conditional signal, just hold the log, right? While you do it. So now the question about some post, do we need to do the same? Well, no, because there is no, uh, generally speaking, no. Uh, when we do some post, it's not really associated with any mutex directly at least. So there is no, uh, unless the problem requires to hold the log, we shouldn't do hold the log, right? So for example, if we have that uh, produce a consumer problem, we will have some weight on the center and then maybe we'll get a log, update the buffer, um, and then we unlock, and then we do some post on the receiver semaphore, right? So something like this. Uh, so if you are talking about producer consumer problem. So we are not holding the log while doing some post because that's definitely not related to this log. Unlike con signal, where con weight is actually associated with the mutex, and you know, for con signal, it's also recommended to hold the log. Uh, here, it's really not needed, right? So I can do some post outside of one log, and that's probably the right way to do that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't hold the log unnecessarily, right? So I can immediately release the log and do some post. Uh, now, the question, this is about like send and receive procedure, right? So that's kind of fine. So send post doesn't require to hold the log. But then there is another case where we have select. Uh, so when we have select, things are a little bit trickier. So when we have select, recall that. Uh, oops. When we have select, uh, we have um, semaphore is a local variable, right? So sem t here, semaphore, we register, we add the semaphore, we add the point to semaphore to the list. Then we'll do some operation. And finally, we remove semaphore from the list pointed to the semaphore from the list. And then we uh, finally will do destroy. I mean, of course, there is also init, semaphore init and so on, right? Uh, so semaphore destroy. So that only exists for the duration of select form, uh, the semaphore. Um, so the problem, the challenge here is that, let's say the other side, whether it's sender or receiver, doesn't matter, right? So let's say it's a receiver and this semaphore was added to the receiver list. So the receiver now will iterate, iterate through the list, through the list, and we'll do some post maybe for every for everyone, right? Just as an example. So it will do some post and that will kind of have some weight here. So that should wake up this guy, right? Um, so now the challenge here is that while we're doing some post, we want to make sure that the semaphore is not destroyed. So because it's going to be destroyed in one short here. Uh, so how do we make sure that it's not destroyed? How do we make sure that select is not done? Because the moment select is done, semaphore will disappear because it's a local variable. So the way that we do that, 
uh, we hold a lock, right? So we hold a receiver, maybe list lock or something like this, and then unlock it eventually. Uh, so we remove it from the list. And here we also lock and unlock. So do we need to hold a lock while doing some post? Why yes or why no? Because when we modify the list or iterate through the list, yeah, we definitely need to hold the lock because only one third of the time can modify this list. But do we need to hold the lock while we're doing some post here? Yes, why? Because it's the yeah, so either, yeah, can you explain? Um, my thinking is that uh, if multiple threads are calling select um, and they're all accessing the same list, then they could all, like, there could be a, uh, what's the word, like a, a issue with the concurrency of the link list. Well, but yeah, this one I already have a lock and a look, right? So that one I protect. That I think is kind of clear, right? So, but why do I need to, why can't I just, Unlock immediately do some post while unlocking that. Like why cannot do some post? Uh, uh, why do I need to do some post while lock uh, while the list uh, while it's still locked? Any idea about this? Okay. So. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but let's say just we have another example, select, right? Another select, right? Uh, or that's, it doesn't matter, maybe not select, but maybe let's say there's another send operation and that send operation is also doing some post on this guy, right? So that will wake up either because of this guy, we will one channel, maybe the other channel will wake up from this guy. So this guy wakes up, uh, you know, uh, maybe performs the operation, doesn't matter which operation it will perform. And then it will go and delete, uh, we'll iterate for the list. Uh, but let's say it's not done yet. It's just somewhere over here. Then this guy gets executed, iterates for the list, find the semaphore. And let's say it's about to call semaphore, but I haven't done it yet. Maybe at that point the thread got preempted. Uh, but we have unlocked. So this guy comes gets the lock, remove it from the list, unlock it, uh, destroy some for this guy wakes up and will call some post on non-existent semaphore. Because it's a pointer, points to some stale pointer, right? It doesn't point to any valid uh, semaphore anymore. Uh, so what's so what is the alternative? If you hold the lock here while doing some post, that will prevent this guy from executing this, right? From removing some of from the list. So either this guy has already done it, it's already removed from the list, then I will not find, uh, will not do some post in the first place, right? If uh, if it's, it was removed already from the list. Or it's still there, uh, but then it cannot remove from the list until I'm holding the lock. And because it cannot remove it from the list, it can also, can also cannot, cannot call it destroy. So we call it, destroy will only happen after I remove from the list. Okay. Do we need a third lock unlock when we add the seven to the list? No, that's just the same lock, right? So it's the same lock unlock. Right? Well, I mean, yeah, so we have to do lock unlock, but it should be the same lock. I mean, you can have different locks for receiver list, you can have different uh, lock for center list, uh, or it can be the same lock, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, but I guess it's definitely going to be different from the buffer lock, right? So that's not the same for the lock, right? Uh, but uh, it's a lock for, for the list. Uh, but you have to hold this lock while you're doing some post from this side, because otherwise semaphore may disappear uh, and semaphore can get destroyed. Uh, you have to kind of prevent deletion uh, from the list by holding the lock. Do we want a binary semaphore? No, that's there is no binary semaphore. That's just a regular semaphore in POSIX, right? Right, but as in like initializing it to one so that it acts like a lock on it. Well, no, no. You, uh, I mean, you're talking about this semaphore? What's when this? We, when we init, when we call sem init, should we initialize it to one so that it? Well, I guess you have to think about this. I guess it should be initialized to zero. 
uh, because initially the default action is to block unless someone notifies you. Uh, so unless someone calls sample, but we will look at some examples today. Some of course, maybe it will be complete. Um, yeah, so uh, you initialize it to one when you can allow one thread to proceed right away. Uh, but here, by default, the action is to block. Any other questions? Okay. Well, there is no sem close. Don't use sem close. That's a different yeah. one. Channel is closed. So what, what do you mean channel closed here? Right. So first of all, this where the channel is closed, I guess that's a concern of underlying send or receive operation, right? Not so much of select. Well, I guess select will also, well, select, the way that select will detect that the channel is closed, it will probably call send and receive, non-blocking version of send and receive, and that will return an error status that is closed channel. So I guess at that point, select can exit. Uh, but, but what is your question? I'm talking about destroy. Destroy function. Oh, destroy function. Uh, yeah, that one assumes that the channel has to be closed. If the channel is not closed, you want to return an error. Well, check the closed flag, right? Uh, so you have this flag that you keep, right? What do you mean done? Well, only one thread calling some destroy. Yeah, so that's not your uh, responsibility. That's just assumption of the, how do we make sure that we may use some other, some for some other primitives to make sure uh, outside, right? Or outside of the channel, how we actually do that, right? So that's not your worry. It's a worry of the user, right? So who is using it? So the user is not allowed to call some destroy while somebody is still using, uh, uh, sorry, the user is not allowed to call channel destroy while some somebody is still using channels. So the user may have to make sure that maybe the thread has joined already, like the thread join or something like this, so that the only one thread is remaining, you know, no one else is running anything concurrently, right? So that's the responsibility of the user, not your responsibility. So the only thing that maybe you want to check is whether the channel is closed when you call destroy. So if it turns out that the channel was not closed previously, which you can fig figure out by looking at the flag, Again, you don't need any mutual exclusion for some uh, for channel destroyer. This is already done. You know the assumption is it's just called by one thread, but you can still check the flag, and if it turns out that the flag was not set, that means the user was not using it correctly. Uh, user didn't close the channel before calling destroy, so maybe you want to return some error status in that case, right? So because you only allow a closed channel to be destroyed. Does it make sense? So it's like, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's another case. In other words, it's some error you want to handle because the user is using something incorrectly, right? User is not doing the right thing. Uh, so I think it makes sense to check that at least, you know, so that you can return destroyer. I think there is destroyer or something like this, uh, so that you can say that I cannot destroy because channel is not closed. Yes. Uh, so, but, you know, the general assumption that user will not do that, uh, you know, so, but still to be on the safe side, you can check that. Any other questions? Does it answer your question? Okay. So again, uh, this is like the same way, uh, like we do some destroy. We cannot do some uh, wait or some post or... Uh, we only, when we do some destroy, right? So a user has to guarantee that we are not doing it. So the same deal with channels, right? Uh, so, you know, so it's our goal to guarantee the fear that we are not calling some post after some destroy. Uh, the same burden is on the user who is using, on, who is using channels. Um, so they are not allowed to call channel destroy while they're still using the channel.
Something weird going on here. One second. Oops. <laughs> well, what's going on here? Just a second. Okay, um, so uh, one thing that I wanted to also describe is how we can use channels. Uh, so we can use it for distance reactor routing and specifically uh, this is how it's used in stress.c uh, in the benchmark. Um, so what is distance vector routing? So that's like distributed uh, a protocol to calculate shortest path. So let's say you have multiple nodes, A, B, C, D, E. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, uh, each network router contains a vector. That means like a list of uh, distances to another, no uh, to another node. Uh, let's say initially A is 0, 1. Uh, that means 0 to A. Um, to B, we have one hop. And to C, D, and E, I don't know how many hops I have yet. So that's kind of like infinity, right? So for B, I know that distance from B to B is zero, distance from B to A is one, and you know to C is one, uh, you know to D is one. Uh, so that's immediate neighbors. Uh, you know the same idea for C, D, and E. But then uh, they will exchange these uh, tables between each other. So like let's say A will exchange its table with B, and uh, B will exchange change the table with C or with D and, you know, D will exchange the table with E and at each point we can calculate a shorter path. So if we see that we can reach node A faster than what we had in the past, we will update the corresponding entry. Uh, so we we'll send this uh, to all neighbors periodically. So let's say uh, D sends its table to E. So E right now doesn't have any idea what the distance to A and B and C is. So it has infinity. So it means it doesn't know how to reach A, B, and C. Uh, so at that point, uh, D can advertise its own table and D is immediate neighbor of E. So now uh, E will see, okay, I can reach uh, B uh, with one hop from D and one hop to D is, uh, I have to from E to D is one hop and D can reach B also with one hop. So I have two hops effectively for B. Uh, so the same as for C. C can be reached from D with one hop, and I also need one hop to reach from E to D. So therefore I can update it and it becomes two also for C. Uh, D is still one, right? E is zero, and A I still don't know because D didn't give me any idea how to reach A. Uh, so it's still infinity. So, but at least was able to get uh, updated for B and C. And as you, you're gonna periodically update and sooner or later, it will get to the point where you know uh, how to reach all your neighbors, right? And sooner or later, uh, after several uh, iterations, you will know how to reach A and you know how to reach uh, any node, right? So from E. And A will also learn how to reach C and D and E and so on. So that is something that is used uh, already, and it's using your implementation of channels to implement this protocol. So this is one of the uh, tests that are uh, used for in the benchmark for channels. So this is where you get your score, right? So it will run your channels and check it under different conditions. Um, 
Okay, so this is just an example how it can be used. Not not a big deal. You don't necessarily need to know this, but just give you an idea why it's why it can be useful. So each router and a node is a thread in our case, and you know, uh, each router has a channel for receiving uh, distances. And yeah, uh, what are what do we need to do? We uh, we need to send and receive, right? So we need. To receive the our neighbor information, we also need to advertise our information to our neighbors. So that's both operation. So this is exactly when we can use select. So this is can be done with channel select, and uh, you know we can have receive, uh, send to first nodes and the uh, to second node and so on. So we support uh, select, right? So uh, yeah, so we want to do any operation whether it's a receive or send. Uh, you know, at each point we are ready to perform uh, either operation, whatever can be completed right away. So this is why, why channels and select in particular can be useful. Just one practical example. Okay, um, any questions so far? So just uh, to remind you semaphores, right? So uh, recall that we had this paradigm with five pens, or like whatever pens, whatever the initial value of semaphore is. Um, so if the initial value is five, we have five pens. And then, you know, each time we take one uh, pen when we call some weight until we uh, run out of all pens. At this point, we will block. Uh, another will block, another thread will block. Then eventually when someone is doing some post, that thread will wake up, one thread will wake up and the semaphore value will be incremented. Um, so that just to remind you, right? So what we had, uh, like I think a couple of lectures ago. Um, yeah, so recall that the moment you have some post, one thread wake up, if if it was sleeping, if any thread was waiting, and when when was somebody waiting, when the semaphore value was less than zero, that means somebody was waiting. So in that case, one thread has to wake up, uh, and the semaphore value will get incremented. So until we reach zero, we can call some wait without blocking. Only when we reach zero. This is when, uh, you know, this is when we have to block, right? So this is when the thread is going to go to sleep and the semaphore is given is going to be minus one, then another thread will do minus two and so on. Same post at any point will increment the semaphore value. And if somebody was waiting and that was, the semaphore value is um, less than zero, uh, then that thread will wake up also. One thread, exactly one thread will wake up. So I guess one uh, question that some people also had, like some try weight versus some weight in the pro in the project. Um, so for condition variables, there is no I think there is no try cond weight or something like this. So for condition variable, things are somewhat simple. If you uh, go and get a murex and see that the buffer is full, then you know you cannot proceed, and you uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, ready to uh, block, right? The same deal with when uh, that's that's for the sender, right? And for receiver, the same deal with when it's empty, it gets the mutex, checks the buffer, it's empty, there is nothing I can do, I can immediately uh, block, right, at that point. So for condition variables, there is no direct correlation between the buffer size or whatever, the how many elements we have in the buffer uh, and uh, the condition variable itself, right? So it just just basically allows us to sleep uh, and until someone wakes wakes up, wakes up right? Uh, so somebody sends signal and we wake up. Um, that is not the case for semaphores. So remember that for condition variable signal can arrive before quant wait. That means uh, this signal goes to nowhere, right? So that means no one will get that signal uh, if no thread was uh, calling quant wait. Uh, and no, nothing will be kind of ever recorded, right? Of the like one signal just went nowhere to nowhere. It was just spurious, right? 
uh, with semaphore, nothing is actually lost. So the, we exactly we keep this uh, value of the semaphore. We always uh, when we do some post, we increment the value. When we do some weight, we decrement the value of the semaphore. Nothing is actually ever get uh, nothing is, is ever going to be lost, right? Um, so for semaphores, it's important to be in sync, right? So at least for reasonable implementation, producer and consumer, you probably want to uh, in initialize semaphore value to the capacity of your buffer for the sender semaphore. And for receiver, that should be, a, a, the semaphore value should represent how many elements are right now in the buffer inserted, right? So that's pretty much what you're gonna have. And that's going to be one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, not the case for condition variables. So, but for condition variables, you can just check, get the mutex. And if it seems like a, there is nothing you can process right now, you can immediately leave, right? So you can just, if the buffer is full, you leave, right? For semaphore, there is no such option. I cannot just get a mutex and, you know, if there is something there, I, you know, just take it or whatever and not update the semaphore value. I should always update the semaphore value. If I'm taking, uh, if I'm gonna take that element, uh, like if the per consumer is gonna consume that element, I have, should update the consumer uh, the semaphore value. Uh, if the producer is gonna put another element, I have to update the corresponding semaphore value. So there is no option to not update uh, that. I, I mean, unless you're doing some, I mean, I guess in a reasonable implementation. I'm not saying that may, maybe somehow you can implement it, but it will be much more complicated version than it's supposed to be, right? Uh, for this problem. Uh, yeah, so that that means for the non-blocking version, you want to use uh, same try weight. So somebody asks what try weight, how is it different from same weight? It's not different if same try weight succeeds. So if same try weight can succeed without blocking, that will decrement, uh, that will decrement the semaphore. So that will just go and decrement the semaphore. If some try weight blocks, then uh, it will return an error status. That is unlike some weight which will block. And so in this case, the value of the semaphore will not get updated. The value of the semaphore is still going to stay the same and you will get the error status. So that's the difference. So no damage has been made, right? So the semaphore. So it just want to try to come, try to do that without blocking and then realize, okay, the semaphore uh, uh, value such that I cannot proceed right away. So I, uh, you know, I'm gonna leave and the semaphore value is still unchanged. So it doesn't really matter whether this threat came or not. I mean, it does, at that point, it, no damage has been made, right? So it's the same value of the semaphore. Just keep that in mind. Um, so you wanna use try weight so that when uh, it succeeds uh, and when you can do a non-blocking operation uh, without waiting, you still update the semaphore value so that your semaphore value doesn't go out of sync or with the buffer size or with whatever the capacity is. So, you know, so there is different approach to implement non-blocking version for condition variables and for semaphores. So for semaphores, you wanna just pretty much follow the same path, just use some try weight instead of some weight. For condition variables, you can just get a mutex, check the status. If it's full, the buffer is full, at that point you can exit, right? Uh, well, yeah, so you will just exit and you don't need to block pretty much that. Yeah. So, or, or if it's a block inversion, you will block on conduit. Okay, go ahead. Well, the block inversion will use some weight. Uh, non block can be using some try weight. So, try weight is exactly the same uh, for the success case uh, and for the failure case when it block, when it would block, uh, it would uh, return an error status. So, that means it will return E again, the OE would block. Uh, so, that means uh, uh, you cannot uh, update the semaphore. Uh, I mean, it cannot. It cannot proceed without blocking. So that's what it is, right? No, I mean, this is the dependent on the parameter to channel send and channel received. You have a question? Can you just check 
Is some weight returns an error? Yeah, so yeah, technically speaking, you should, uh, and we have other error in channel send and channel re receive, uh, but I guess we are not strictly enforcing it in the uh, in the test. So it's probably okay uh, to not check what some weight returns because it can only fail if you're passing some wrong argument to or something like that, right? Uh, the same deal for some try weight, you can <clears throat> assume that it only fails when it blocks, when, when it would block, right? So that's the only condition when it should fail normally. Um, I mean, again, you want to clarify the status if the channel is closed, you want to return the closed error rather than would block. But still, uh, you know, so still, uh, it's pretty much the only condition you have. So the other error conditions typically will not happen. Uh, but if you really want to be precise, you have this other error for other errors, right? So, so if so you can check some weight, if it fails, return other error or something like that. So yeah, it's up to you. But I will not be strictly enforcing that part. For select, do we care if it's blocking or non blocking? I'd assume not since we're just creating a send up for any. Well, select uh, has to call send and receive, but because it can potentially call multiple send and receive, it has to call non block conversion. So none of them is allowed to block, right? Uh, but this is exactly why we have a separate semaphore for select. This is when we have to block. Okay, any other questions? So in, in other words, implement non-blocking version, then you can use it in select uh, because that because otherwise you have to re-implement send and receive again. So let's talk about some problems with semaphores uh, and how, like, I, I, I mean, I, I guess we still haven't covered read the write log, but let's cover that after Thanksgiving break. It's not that uh, that important for the project, but maybe looking at some examples would be useful, right? So let's look at some examples. So to so make sure that you better understand semaphores. And again, we have this textbook, a uh, little, uh, the little book of semaphores. You can look at some examples there. There's some interesting, you know, problems, including those that we discussed today. Um, and there are different solutions to these problems. Yeah. So let's look at the first problem: sleep, uh, sleeping barber problem. So there is a cutting room with one chair and uh, you know a waiting room with several chairs. So you come to the barber, the customer comes to the barber to get a haircut. Uh, so basically uh, when the barber uh, finishes cutting hair, it will check the waiting room to get a new customer. Uh, if there are none, uh, so there's all customers are done, right? So uh, the uh, barber will return to the chair and sleeps in this chair. So then when the customer arrives, it wakes up the barber if he's sleeping. And if the barber is, uh, you know, cutting a hair already, so the customer will, wait, uh, will stay in the waiting room. And if there is no free chair, the customer has to leave. So in the waiting room, sooner or later, we may also run out of the chairs. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's the general idea. So again, you may wonder why we're looking at this kind of problems. We don't have barbers or uh, cutting rooms in operating systems, but we have similar uh, problems. Sometimes we have, you know, some resource, some uh, which we have to multiple threads try to compete for this resource, and then you know they have to wait and so on. So there is similar problems that we have to solve in operating systems. So therefore, it totally makes sense to look at these problems, even though they are not directly applicable to operating systems, but uh, that kind of allows us to think about this problem in a more abstract way. Okay. So what issues we may have this, this, uh, in this problem? So a customer arrives, uh, but goes to the waiting room because the barber is cutting hair. So right after this, the barber finishes and checks the waiting room and sees that the, you know there is not, no one in the waiting room. 
because the customer went to the, uh, you know, uh, the cu customer arrives and wants to check whether the barber uh, is, you know, barber can handle the customer, right? So it's already in the hallway, right? And the barber goes to the waiting room and doesn't see anyone. So the barber uh, will say, okay, no customers, I'm going to go back and sleep. So then the customer, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the customer will not be able, you know, uh, to also get a haircut because previously this, the customer saw that the barber was cutting someone else's hair and there was just a short period when they kind of, the customer was still in the hallway and the barber was like checking the waiting room. So they didn't see each other. So now customer assumes that the barber is busy and the barber assumes that there is no customers. So at that point we have a deadlock. Right, so basically, a barber is waiting for a customer, and a customer is waiting for the barber. So the customer mistakenly thinks that the barber is busy, uh, because that's like the last time uh, maybe this customer saw that the barber was another customer, and then uh, you know, the barber just checked the waiting room, but the customer was still in the hallway, uh, so it, the barber didn't notice the customer. So, so that, therefore, the barber also misses this customer. So they will, unless some other customer arrives and wakes up the barber, so they will, uh, uh, so we will want to get in a deadlock situation in this case. So that's one issue. Any questions? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so this is kind of a race condition, right? So this is pretty much a race condition which results in a deadlock pretty much. <clears throat> okay, so then we have two customers uh, that arrive at the same time. Uh, but only once it is available. Uh, so then we have to also resolve that issue, right? So because multiple customers may try to sit on the same chair, right? Because they, you know, uh, like, you know, since the barber is cutting the hair, they will both try to sit on this chair, right? So that's another issue that we have to, another race condition that we have to take care of. Okay. Um, so what can we do? Uh, so we can have a mutex. Uh, so it's sort of critical section. When a customer cre enters the critical section, that means who enters this waiting room, uh, it acquire the customer will get a mutex. So the second customer cannot enter until the first one releases this mutex. It's like you enter in the door, have to do finish this as soon as possible to sit in your chair, right? And so that the next one can enter. Um, but you kind of preventing the second customer from entering and uh, grabbing your chair, right? Um, so if a free chair is available, we increment the customer semaphore. Uh, so, and then uh, we will wake up the barber if the barber is sleeping. So that's kind of to summarize what we want to do. But let's look uh, at the actual implementation. We will have a semaphore for customers. So when customers arrive, they will increment the semaphore. Uh, we will have a semaphore for the barber. When the barber is ready to get uh, to give a haircut, uh, the barber will uh, use that semaphore. They will post on this semaphore. Uh, then we have a mutex for the critical section, specifically for the Sweden room, um, so that we only grab one uh, chair. And finally, we have number of seats uh like initially it's number of seats is n so let's see what we can do for the barber so it's just some you know comments are kind of uh went to the second line but it should be pretty much clear still yeah so the barber uh will wait for a customer so we'll do some wait on customers so the barber in remember initially there is no customers. So the initial default action for the barber is to wait, right? So the barber will sleep because there are no customers. Customers sum of is zero. So the barber will, initial, will initially block here until some customer arrives. Let's say some customer arrived. Right? Let's say some customer arrived and uh, notified the barber. Just I will show that in a moment, but let's say that happens, right? Uh, so that the semaphore value is at least one. So then the barber will uh, get a lock mutex, right? So that uh, on this mutex, uh, they'll take this customer, 
say, okay, now you can enter the cutting room. So we'll increment the number of chairs available for waiting customers. So because this customer doesn't no longer needs to stay in the waiting room. So we can now increment the number of chairs there. So initially, uh, you know, when a customer enters, uh, the customer has to grab the chair. But now the chair can be increased, right? So then we bring customer for haircut. So that will notify the other semaphore that the barber is ready now. So the uh, customer was blocked on that. Uh, I will show that in a moment. So the barber will notify the customer that now it's ready to give the haircut. And then finally, it will unprotect chairs and barber now is cutting the head. Right, so let's look at the customer. So the customer uh, case, uh, again, I'm sorry, some comments went to the second line, but uh, it should still be pretty uh, clear what it is. Um, so, so the customer enters. The first thing the customer needs to do is to get the, uh, to enter the critical section, to the, the critical section of the waiting room, right? So the, the first thing that the customer will do is grab the lock. Because the customer wants to find an available chair to sit in the waiting room. So the customer grabs the lock and sees whether there is any seats available. Initially, remember, seats was initialized to N, right? So initially, we have some seats. Uh, so if seats is greater than zero, then we will do some operations. But let's assume uh, that, uh, that there are no seats available. That's else statement in this uh, in this case, right? Then we will unprotect the murex. So we will just sorry uh, uh, unprotect chairs by unlocking the murex, right? So we'll call unlock murex, and the customer will leave. When no chairs available. The customer cannot sit anywhere, so the customer will just leave, right? So that's the that's the oh, that was the condition, right? So if you don't have anything uh, any space available in the waiting room, the customer leaves. Uh, yeah, so so leaves without a haircut. So else statement is clear. So now let's look at the main statement when the, we have some seats available. So the number of seats is greater than zero. Uh, so let me, uh, give me one second. Just... I just want to open uh, so that it doesn't go to the next line. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think this is a little bit better. Okay. So again, if there is no seats available, the customer leaves without a haircut and just unlocks the mutex and that's it. So now let's say there are some seats available. So the first thing that we're gonna do, we're gonna grab the seat. So number of seats is decreased. So seats, we decrement number of seats, right? Then we notify the barber that some customer is there in the waiting room. Remember the customer barber will go to sleep if there's no one we uh, if there's no one waiting. As soon as there is one customer in the waiting room, the barber has to wake up. So the barber was blocked on some wait customers. And now we have some post uh, that will notify the barber, right? So the same post will wake up uh, a barber and, you know, that some wait will un get unblocked. So and the barber will be able to proceed. Because before the first customer arrives, the barber sleeps. Um, so the moment we grab the chair and notify the barber, now we can unlock the murex, right? So we are no longer in the critical section. We are having our own seat. Uh, we are not in kind of limbo state uh, when we need to kind of have a seat, nor we, nor we notify the barber. So we notify the, the barber at this point. So we can unlock the murex. So then what may happen? We have one customer. Maybe that customer will be processed by the barber right away. But the second customer notified the barber that it's, uh, uh, you know, that it can get a haircut now. It's waiting in the waiting room. But the barber is busy. Barber is handling the first customer. So what happens? How do we handle that? 
So we have to wait if barber is busy on some wait barber. So remember initially that semaphore was zero. So initially the barber is, the default uh, action is the barber is not available, right? So barber is busy, right? Only when barber is available, uh, uh, the barber will do some post on the barber and that will bring the, that first customer. But now let's say this customer comes, the barber has not called some post yet. Either because it was just still uh, in this, uh, like bringing this customer to the cutting room, or like uh, maybe it was cutting hair for the previous customer, doesn't matter, right? Uh, so we will block on some weight in this case, right? So if the barber is cutting hair right now, or, uh, you know, or one way or the other, they didn't call some post, we are waiting on it. Um, so then eventually some weight. Uh, some post barber will wake up one customer, exactly one customer, because we are only have one some post. That will wake up one customer, and then uh, now this customer will have a haircut. So let's uh, look uh, more details what happens with the customers and barber some course. I know it may be a little bit confusing when you look at, at it right now, but uh, let's uh let's look at specific example uh so just to clarify this some post will wake up this some way right so this uh, some barber will wake up this some way barber. okay uh so what is the value for the semaphore for the customer semaphore? What is the value for customer semaphore? Uh, well, it can go from zero. So the customer semaphore can be zero initially. That means uh, the barber is going to win. So what else we can have? So the moment the first customer arrives, customer one, that will get incremented. That will get one, right? The moment the second customer arrives, it's going to get two, three, and so on, right? So the customer's semaphore will go from zero and you know grade some uh, greater. That's going to be greater or equal than zero, right? So if there are no customers, the barber sleeps. As soon as there is one customer, that same weight will immediately kind of fall through, right? So that means it will decrement the semaphore and will proceed. So we are only going to be blocked on the same weight customers if there are no customers right now. Otherwise, the moment there is at least one customer, some weight should not block um, because the value is greater or equals than zero, right? So now let's look at the barber semaphore. So that's actually different. Uh, so initial value is zero. The barber semaphore is initially uh, zero. But then uh, what can, what else we can have? Uh, well, let's just forget about some post on the barber side for a second. Uh, but what other values we can have for the customers? So the first customer comes, sooner or later it will call some weight. Uh, on the barber. So that may become minus one. The second com customer comes, it will do minus two, minus three, minus four, and so on, right? So now the barber comes and calls some post. So the first waiting customer, zero, will wake up, right? So the, it will wake up exactly one thread. So then barber is, so then the sum of four value is incremented, right? So it, it's going to get plus one. So then the next time, in the next second iteration, the barber comes because it's, see it's a while true loop. So we are gonna have second iteration. So the, eventually the barber uh, will do some weight on customers, which will fall through because we have additional customers. And then it will do some post on the barber that will wake up the second customer, then third customer, fourth customer, whatever, right? So that some post will bring one customer at a time. So the only, I guess, corner case is that no customers called some weight yet. So the value is still zero. 
So the value is still zero for the barber. But then the barber calls some post. So that will get uh, one, right? So that will be one, right? So zero will become one. So that means Barbara says, I'm ready to cut the hair, right? But that can only happen if there is already one waiting customer, right? It can only happen if there's at least one customer waiting already, right? Uh, because otherwise we would not call some post. That's the condition we have to do some wait customers first. Uh, so one customer is, wait, uh, is there, but maybe one this one customer is still in the hallway or something like this, right? So only when the customer calls some wait, uh, uh, that will get back to zero, right? But that's some weight on the customer will fall through, right? So it will not block on, on for the first customer because the barber already notified that it's ready. So the first customer can proceed right away. So that when we do some weight on the barber, that will, if the value of the semaphore is one, the, this customer can proceed right away. But the second customer will not be able to proceed right away. So the second customer will have to wait. So it only allows up to one customer to enter right away. Um, so the condition, whether the barber says I'm ready, you can uh, get a higher card, or the customer says I'm ready to get a higher card, and the barber says, okay, I'm ready. That can, you know, that depends on the exact circumstances, right? So whether it's zero or one, it will depend, right? But, uh, uh, but you know, one way or the other, it will still uh, just bring one customer at a time. Right, so it's still going to work in both cases. So I just wanted to mention that Barber can potentially notify some post before any customer calls some way. But it will do only one some post. Remember that it's only one some post. Okay. I'm confused how that could happen though, because for Barber, the first thing is to call some way on customers, and if no customers have posted, then It'll yeah, but you see the uh, the second uh, sum of course, same weight on the barber, right? So the first customer, okay, so same first customer, that's done, right? We unlock the mutex, right? Uh, and then we do some weight on the barber, right? But let's say the thread is delayed. Maybe it's preempted before it calls some weight barber. So it notified the barber there is one customer there and maybe the spread got preempted. So then the barber will post some post before us. Uh, so, but that means when we are scheduled again, this customer scheduled again, like the thread scheduled again, uh, like that some weight will immediately proceed without blocking. Does it make sense? So, I mean, yeah, so there is kind of corner case, whether the barber notifies that it's ready or the customer notifies that it's ready, right? So someone notifies us, uh, like maybe the barber will first say I'm ready and the customer then comes and maybe the customer says I'm ready and then the barber brings this customer, right? Uh, so it's, uh, you know, this is the only corner case that we have to, uh, I guess, worry about. But, you know, the key thing here is that the value of the semaphore I mean, except this one case when the barber is fir first, the value of the semaphore is going to be less or equals than zero. So it's going to be zero on my, so I mean, except one case, right? So I guess you should say less or equals than one, right? But uh, it can potentially be one, right? But it's zero minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on, right? And this value of that semaphore was greater or equals than zero <laughs> for customers. So just keep that in mind, right? What's the minimum value? I'm sorry? What's the minimum value? Minimum value? Well, the minimum value, as many customers as we have, right? If they have 100 customers waiting, it can be minus 100, right? Why is it minus 100? Well, yeah, so that's going to be determined by the number of seats, of course, right? So if you have number of seats, five, right? That cannot go beyond minus five, right? Yeah, so you only have uh, as, many, as many as you have seats, right? So it doesn't make sense? 
So just go through this. I just give you like kind of hint, right? So some weight customers is greater or equal than zero, right? So this is why the sum of our values is always greater or equal than zero. And for uh, for the barber, it generally less or equal than zero, except one corner case when the barber rise before the first customer, then uh, it indicates that it's ready. Then it can potentially be also one, right? But you know, it's so it's technically uh, less or equals than one, right? So by the way, question here. Uh, well, I guess I will ask that question for the next problem, right? Let me, uh, for this problem, it probably doesn't make too much sense, uh, but for the next problem, maybe it will be an interesting question. Okay, uh, so what is the, uh, what is the, was for the sleeping barber, right? So this solution is deadlock free. So that means one customer is handled, right? So it's not like barber is sleeping and the customer is sleeping at the same time, right? Uh, so we solve that problem by using this, uh, you know, two semaphores and uraxes. So yeah, but it's not starvation free. So first of all, the same weight, uh, if the schedule is unfair, uh, it's possible that we bring some, and some customers kind of unlock and sit in, in the waiting room. But I guess another issue, even aside from that, um, that the customer comes, sees, oh, and then it sees that, okay, I cannot get a, uh, a seat in the waiting room. So the customer leaves. So then the another, uh, then maybe this customer comes back later, tries to get a seat and, you know, uh, again, doesn't get a seat and so on, right? So eventually this customer is starving, right? So it will never able to get service from this barber. Uh, yeah, I guess the way that you can solve it, you can kind of use PyFQ maybe on the street, you have some line, right, uh, of customers who were not able to get a seat inside. Uh, but it's kind of tricky because at that point, uh, I guess you're also still organizing some queue, right? So some, you know, there is some waiting line or something like this, right? We already have a waiting line inside. Uh, so why do we do it outside? I guess you may argue that maybe in operating systems, one resource may be less precious than another resource. So you can have unlimited number of threads waiting for one uh, in one line and maybe in one queue and the other queue should only be limited to certain number of threads. So you can still make that analogy, but it's more like a philosophical problem at that po point. So if we are waiting in one, <laughs> one place, then we have to wait in one place. Why we're not just making our waiting room larger? Right, so and eventually we cannot make it infinite, right? So it's a little tricky. Uh, yeah, so now um, let's look at the dining philosopher problem. So I just wanna clarify uh, here uh, that for dining philosophers, you will find some uh, solutions uh, which claim to be starvation free, uh, like Tannin Tannenbaum textbook, but they're not actually starvation free. Uh, but even though there is a sol solution that um, I think there, there exists a solution for Dine and philosophy starvation free, but it's not that simple, right? So, so let me put it that way. Uh, so it's not, uh, so if you read in Tannenbaum textbook and it claims starvation free, that's actually not. So, and we are not going to look at that solution for that reason, because it's only deadlock free eventually. And, you know, there is no value in looking at that. Um, but, you know, this is how it can get tricky. Even in textbooks, we can have some mistakes. Uh, so, yeah, anyway. Uh, so let me describe this problem. So we have five philosophers. Uh, so every philosopher needs uh, uh, two forks to eat. Or you can have a different analogy with chopsticks and something like this, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so, but let's just assume we are just using forks. So to eat, we have to get two forks. Uh, we have to, the, the philosopher has to get the left fork and the right fork. Um, but the, each philosopher can only pick up one uh, fork at a time. So it cannot just grab two forks at the same time. You can only get one left and then right or the other way around, right and then left. So philosophers only eat when they have two forks. And, you know, we have assumed that there's infinite supply of spaghetti, there's infinite amount of, like, uh, space in stomach and whatever, right? Uh, so there is no issues with hygiene, right? So they can, you know, use the same fork 
uh, you know, there is no problems like this. Uh, yeah, so let's look how we can solve that problem. So we have semaphores uh, and which each of semaphore will represent a uh, fork. So then each philosopher will, okay, so each philosopher will have two operations, like either think or eat, right? So basically, uh, you know, philosophers, is, I mean, that I think uh, analogy may be sleeping, but let's just, you know, they want, I think they're thinking while they're sleeping or something like this. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, so they think or they eat. Um, so uh, so then the philosopher, this philosopher will pick up the left fork. This is fork I, and then the right fork, fork I plus one. So an I plus one is actually circular, right? So it should be modulo five. So that means for the fifth philosopher, we're going to grab fork zero. So it's a module operation, just like we looked at the circular buffer in the past. So just, you know, I'm not showing it here, but it should be module five. Um, and then we, of course, after we eat, after the philosopher eats, uh, it will release the left fork and release the right fork. So is there any problem with the solution? Is it deadlock free? No, it's not deadlock free. Uh, yeah, so it's gonna, uh, so let's see what will happen. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, like every philosopher pick up the left fork before any of them picks up the right fork. So everyone will wait for the right fork. So that means everyone grabs left fork, but now everyone has to wait for the right fork. You see like this philosopher grab this fork, then another philosopher. So eventually we run out of forks, no one can proceed. So they will wait for each other. So it's a deadlock. So what can we do? We can limit the number of philosophers that eat at any point of time. So we'll have room equals to five semaphore. And before philosophers grab any forks, they will do some weight on the room. Right? So they will uh, subtract this uh, semaphore value. Only four philosophers at a time will be able to proceed. So in this case, you see uh, uh, four philosophers are trying. One uh, was able to grab two forks. He's happy and now he's, he's eating. And the fifth philosopher was denied, right? So because we only allow four philosophers at a time. Uh, so, but, you know, it can solve the problem, but, you know, it's not really solving the original problem. In the original problem, we didn't have that kind of limitation that uh, the fifth philosopher, you know, is not allowed to eat. Uh, I mean, this fifth philosopher, of course, is random. It doesn't have to be this particular philosopher, but we only allow four philosophers. That's not good. Um, so, okay. Uh, so another case, what we, another solution we can have First four philosophers will do the pick up the left fork, right fork. So they will be left-handed. And the fifth philosopher will be right-handed. So the fifth philosopher will first grab the right fork and then the left fork. So will it solve the problem? Let's check that. Uh, so the first, uh, oh, this is, um, yeah, I guess I had like nice animation, but, uh, yeah, let me, give me one second. Uh, just uh, just give me one second. Um, just want to show that. Okay. Okay, uh, so what we have here is, uh, okay, let's give this fourth. Uh, yeah, so now let's say this philosopher grabs this fork, right? Uh, left fork. Then another philosopher grabs another left fork. Another philosopher grabs this left fork, right? Le another left fork. Finally, the fifth philosopher will grab the right fork, but it cannot because the right fork is already taken. So it has to wait, right? So, and therefore it will not, this fifth philosopher will not grab the left fork. So now this fourth philosopher is happy now. So the fourth philosopher can grab four, two forks. So he can now eat. 
yeah, so and at that point, we this is how we can solve the deadlock problem, right? So by determining, by dedicating one philosopher as a right-handed, right, so as opposed to left-handed. So one philosopher will do, will graph works in a different order. So that way we solve the problem. So it's still not starvation free, of course, right? So one, it's possible that one philosopher is starving and one is always eating or something like this, right? Uh, as I said, starvation free uh, solutions are tricky. And you can look at this, uh, uh, you know, actually you can look in the little book of semaphores. There's also the same problem is described there. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, but in general, generally speaking, I think that also described the turning bound solution is not correct. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so for, from the starvation uh, perspective, right? So, but it's still possible to solve it, but it's just not that trivial. Uh, 